Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's it going? So very, very good to be with you this morning, studying the Bible together and thinking about how to teach the Bible, especially teaching the Gospels, is the focus of this session. So my name's John Taylor, and I am a professor of New Testament here, also directing what we call our academic graduate studies, which means our PhD program. And uh, before that, before I was an academic, I was a missionary for many years, uh, urban missions and in the city in uh, England. Before that, I grew up in Australia. So, uh, yep, uh, sort of been around the world. And, uh, but I'm so glad to be here. I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer as we start. Thank you, our dear Lord, for the chance to look at your word today and to think about how to study it and how to teach it how to communicate it. Open our hearts and minds. Give us wisdom from above. And Lord, make us effective for your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> so, living truth, walking with Jesus through the Gospels. And uh, when I think about the Gospels and I think about what it means to study through and teach through the Gospels. I always think about a journey because the Gospels are a journey. Each of them is a story. Uh, and if you read the Gospels, you'll find uh, that the writers actually are very keen to show you that there's a journey going on. They're always telling you where Jesus is. They're telling you when he moves from one place to another. Uh, they're telling you it's a kind of life journey wrapped up in a geographical journey. And for my understanding, the key to successfully teaching the Gospels is to follow that journey, follow that path with Jesus. So that we as readers of the Gospels need to walk with him through that journey. And so three points at this point, that I, at this stage that I want to make in particular, first of all, we need to walk where Jesus walked. By the way, this picture is an actual first century pavement uh, on one of the roads in Jerusalem. Uh, almost certainly Jesus walked across these stones several times. So, but we want to walk where Jesus walked as much as we can from West Coast USA. And so uh, what that means, of course, we wanna get right into the world of the gospels and we want to engage with it and think it through and walk it through just as, as close as we possibly can to put ourselves in the shoes of Jesus' disciples and the other people that are around. And uh, so that takes some research. It takes some imagination. But most of all, it takes reading. It takes reading of the text. It takes reading of the gospel over and over. So to walk where Jesus walked. Secondly, walk, don't run. Walk, don't run. You know, it's a trend in 21st century churches uh, that we want every, every sequence we do to be over in six weeks. We want six-week sermon series. We want two weeks. It'd be better, you know. <laughs> Uh, because we feel like that everybody has short attention spans and uh, we don't want to bore them with something that lasts too long. And uh, I, can I just give you some advice? If you're going to teach the first century book about a first century Jesus, you have to slow down the first century pace just a little. There are no cars planes, internet, telephones in the first century. And not many people could afford even a horse or a donkey. And so you walked everywhere. And so the best way to read the Gospels is to walk, don't run. Just take your time if you're going to teach the Gospel. Walk at the pace that the Gospel is going. You don't have to rush it. Just read and read and read, and the investment is always worth it. Thirdly, walk the whole way. Get to the end of the journey. 
This is where some people have favorite parts of their gospel. Some people love the teaching of Jesus. They want to linger over the teaching, but the, act, the action, the conversations, the conflicts, or even the whole final part of the gospels, you know, about the cross and everything, they sometimes they don't want to get into that. I just want to see what Jesus was teaching. Other people want to read the stories. But the gospels are perfectly balanced to give us the spiritual food that we need and to introduce us to Jesus in the way that he wants to be introduced. And so we need to walk the whole way. Don't skip. What about it, those genealogies? What are you going to do with them? How are you going to teach the genealogies of Matthew and Luke? You know what? They're Jesus' family history, and they tell a story. They tell the story of how Jesus becomes the son of David, that is, the Messiah. That's Matthew's genealogy. It tells an amazing story. So walk the whole way. Walk, don't run. Walk where Jesus walked. And tell the story of Jesus. Now, you wouldn't be here today unless you're pretty keen on Jesus, you know. I expect we've got some of the cream of the crop here. We've got people who just love God and want to help others grow in the Lord and want to help, help others to move on in their faith. So I'm speaking, if you like, preaching to the choir here, people who are already on board with this idea. But listen, it's amazing how many people who've been in church for many, many years or just a few years don't actually know the story. They've heard the name Jesus, they've heard him preached, they've heard bits and pieces about him, but they've actually never read the gospel. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands today and say if you've read all four gospels through. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I imagine you have, but if you haven't, can I just encourage you? Before you can tell the story, you have to read the story for yourself. Can I just encourage you, make it your personal project when you get home from today, just open up Matthew chapter 1 and get through to the end of John chapter 21 and just go for it. It won't take you that long. It'll be better than another hour on the internet. So just encourage you, before we can talk about telling the story of Jesus, we need to think carefully about how our own reading of the Gospels and say, Am I reading do I, the Gospels all the way through from start to finish? Do I know the story? Because one of the problems in, that Christians have faced over centuries when they're interpreting the Bible, trying to find its meaning, is, is a, a, a kind of what I call parachute preaching. And in parachute preaching, we land on the Bible, on a part of the Bible from above. We float down onto it, and we maybe get to Luke chapter 4, and we just land on it. And then we leave again. You know, we just kind of parachute in, uh, and, uh, and then we leave. And, we, and we're doing that. All we see of Jesus is some still pictures. It's like we miss the movie, but we get the slideshow. Because we're not actually reading the story. And this generation are very narrative oriented, right? Younger generation, they want the story. It's not enough to give them some snapshots of your Israel vacation. They want the video, <laughs> right? People don't read books, they watch YouTube. So if you're going to teach the Gospels, you need to tell the story tell the story. And so, first of all, you need to know it. And then, of course, you need to tell it. So, let's just, go, let's just run through today. What's the story of Jesus in the Gospels? Now, you might think you know it, and you probably do. But it's amazing how, when we go through this story, how many people don't actually have it all set in their mind, what was the story of Jesus and the Gospels. So I'm just going to run through this quickly, and I don't mean to insult anybody who thinks, I know this, I've read the Gospels a hundred times. If you do well, 
101 times won't, 101st time won't hurt you. So, birth and origins. All four Gospels have, a, have some account of Jesus' origins. Only two of them have what we call a birth narrative, a story about Jesus being born. Does anybody know what two Gospels those are? Luke is one of them. Good. Matthew. Excellent. So Matthew and Luke talk about the birth of Jesus. John and Mark start with Jesus grown up. So, but they all, four Gospels, have an introduction to Jesus. Luke, Mark's introduction to Jesus is one verse long before he starts on the story. Mark 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right there he's told you a whole lot. Jesus, he says, is the Messiah, Christ, and he's the Son of God. And it's good news. Here it comes. Get started. Matthew's what we call birth narrative, the chapters in Matthew that talk about the birth of Jesus, they revolve around, they're structured around, we believe it or not, they're structured around a series of, of dreams that Joseph has. And as you read the birth story in Matthew, just look for Joseph's dreams because every time Joseph has a dream, it moves the story forward and carries on. Luke's birth narrative is like uh, a contrast and comparison between John the Baptist and Jesus because it tells the story of these two boys who are cousins and both have miraculous births, except Jesus is a bit more even more miraculous, right? Because of virgin birth. But Luke's gospel tells the story of John's birth, Jesus' birth, John's growing up, Jesus growing up, and it's just basically, and, and everyone along the way is basically saying, John is great. John is amazing. He, his birth was from God. He's going to be a prophet. And then Jesus is greater. He's the son of God, not simply a prophet of God. And so the birth origins set a lot of the agenda for the rest of the Gospels. That's why Christmas is so good for people teaching the Gospels because you can just teach those stories, and they're familiar. But do the whole thing. Walk the whole way. You know, born in Bethlehem near Jerusalem, born of a virgin, you know this, born the Son of God, born to be the Messiah, the Word made flesh, as John says. And... Uh, by the way, this, this PowerPoint, I don't make, I don't, I'm happy to make it available at least as PDF or something. I'll make it available to anybody who wants it. So let me know. And then we have what we might call the beginnings of ministry. And the beginnings of ministry would be where Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River. And do you remember what happens when he's baptized? The Holy Spirit comes down upon him in the form of a dove. And the Father speaks from heaven and says... This is my beloved son, whom I'm pleased. So Jesus is baptized. He's affirmed by God. He's recognized publicly by the Father as being his son. And yet he's baptized. Luke says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Because Jesus is baptized as a man. He's God in the flesh, but he's baptized because he's a man. And he's being baptized to identify with us, with people. And it also says in Luke that when he was baptized, he was praying. And that's when the Holy Spirit comes upon, comes upon him. Jesus, in, for Jesus, baptism says he's a true human. He's the son of God. And he has the spirit. That's what it tells us about Jesus. And of course, we know what happens after that. Temptations. In the wilderness, the testing in the wilderness. The word, by the way, the Greek word for testing and temptation, the same word. And it doesn't mean they mean it means both of them every time you see it. 
It just mean, but it can mean either one. And you've got to kind of choose which is best. So, but Jesus is certainly being tested out there in the wilderness. And when he, is, when he overcomes the tests and comes back, that's when he begins to ministry in Galilee mainly. Now, John has a little different. Uh, I'll tell you about that in a moment. But and by the way, these photos uh, are from Galilee. This uh, a Capernaum here. And uh, not, not far from there, this is on the Sea of Galilee. So, so Jesus moves from Nazareth, which is north of the Sea of Galilee, and he moves from Nazareth south to the, the lake. And he, and he starts living in a city or a town called Capernaum, where Peter and, is, is, and, and John and their business are based. He's kind of in and around there. And so he, st- he moves house from his, where he grew up with his parents. And now he's going to move and he's going to do something different. He's going to stop being a carpenter, a builder. Jesus is the word for builder in the Gospels. Uh, tecton, it means something like a contractor, right? If, if Jesus lived today, he'd have a tool belt to pick up and he would, you know, build things. And so... Uh, He's based in Capernaum, and he starts traveling around and doing miracles, casting out demons, teaching. And it's in this period that he has also the beginnings of opposition. And when he starts, people start getting upset with him for doing horrible things, like healing people on a Saturday, which created a lot of stir. Or... Uh, things like this, and he gets opposition. He gets very popular. He appoints the 12 disciples as apostles. He gets some followers, and they begin to follow Jesus. We talk all the time about following Jesus, but of course, if you were going to follow Jesus in the first century, literally, you had to follow Jesus. In fact, there's a great scene in the Gospel of uh, Mark. It's in the other synoptic Gospels as well, Matthew and Luke. But it's a great scene there where uh, Jesus has, has just spoken to the disciples, said, who do say, people say that I am? And they're selling, they say, well, I think you're a prophet. You know, they, you, maybe you're Elijah, maybe you're John the Baptist, maybe you're Jeremiah. Basically, people look at Jesus and they, he looks like a prophet. But Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter has, got, has finally got it in his head. He got the revelation, and he says, you know, you're the son, you know, the son of God. You're the Messiah, the Christ, the son of, of the living God. And so that was, well, son of the living God, that phrase is in Matthew. So J- Jesus is happy about this, but immediately he starts telling his disciples, well, you know, uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be... Uh, arrested and badly treated and killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter is just, this doesn't make sense. He just got the idea that Jesus, son of God and messianic king of Israel, you, you, they're going to put you to death. That doesn't, you know, and he gets, he, he gets right in Jesus' face and says, you know, no, don't do that. This should never happen. And Peter, and Jesus looks at Peter, they're walking along the road, and as they walked all the time, and, he, and he, gets, he gets in Peter's face, and he says, get behind me, Satan. Now, literally, he means, get behind me. Because, he said, then he says, if anyone wants to follow after me, follow behind me, let him take up his cross and follow if you're going to follow Jesus, you can't do it from in front. You can't get in Jesus' face and tell him what, what he should be doing. You've got to get in. And so Jesus is literally telling Peter, get back behind there where you belong in the group following. And Jesus calls the whole crowd and says, if anyone wants to, you know, wants to follow me, he needs to take up his cross and get in line, get behind, keep on be a follower. 
And so the 12 are appointed, and they, they, they main, their first job, according to Mark's gospel, is to hang out with Jesus. He says he appointed 12 to be with him. I love this idea of withness, where you, you're supposed to just be with Jesus. And then you get sent out to preach and do all that miracles and things. But first job of a disciple is withness, just hanging out with Jesus. Now, mission of the, then they start to get sent out. You see, after they've been with him for a while, then they can be sent out on their own little short-term outreach where they have to do the easy stuff like raising the dead, cleansing lepers, casting out demons, and proclaiming the kingdom. After they've been ministering in Galilee, Galilee for some period, we don't exactly know how long this is, but it's a majority of Jesus' public ministry is in Galilee. And if you, if you know the geography of Israel at the time, but Jerusalem and Judea are in the south, Galilee is, and, and Nazareth, Capernaum, they're in the north. And in between is Samaria. So, in this, it comes to a, the ministry comes to a turning point. And in that turning point, this is where the direction changes from Galilee ministry. Now we're going to start to look towards ministry in Jerusalem, ministry in Judea, in the south, and eventually to the cross and the resurrection. And in this turning point, certain important things happen. First of all, what I've already mentioned, Peter gets the revelation that Jesus is Messiah and Son of God. And Jesus, in this period, we get what we call the transfiguration. Jesus gets lit up on the mountain. And God affirms him from heaven, said again, this is my son, my beloved son. And he says, listen to him. Because on the mountain with Jesus, Moses and Elijah appear. And that's important because Moses had, prophes had said, prophesied in Deuteronomy 18. He'd prophesied that after me, there's going to come a prophet like me. And he's going to, you know, and you should listen to him. So Moses is up there on the mountain with Jesus and Elijah, another prophet. And the father speaks from heaven. This is my son. I'm with you listen to him. And therefore, Jesus is the prophet like Moses who's going to come, but he's more than a prophet. He's the son of God. Now, Jesus starts to predict his death and his resurrection. Three times he predicts his death and resurrection. Three times the disciples misunderstand. I just don't get it at all. And three times he then says to them, and by the way, you also need to well, you're going to die as well, basically. He says, you need to take up your cross. What, what, what does this mean to take up your cross? Uh, think about this <laughs> for a minute. What does it mean to take up your cross? Daily, if you, uh, let's, let's take, if you, uh, we, I don't know if you have, we don't have executions, I think, in California these days, but uh, maybe we do, I don't know. But if we did, I, mean, I used to live in Texas. They certainly do there. And they I don't use the cross, they don't crucify, they use the electric chair. So if, uh, you know, if, if, if your pastor said, right, we're going to take up our electric chairs and, uh, and follow Christ. Or go back 100 years, take up our nooses. That sounds terrible. But the cross is the symbol of a nasty form of execution. So when, when we make a nice cross with gold and uh, diamonds on it and everything, you know, remember, you could be in diamond encrusting an electric chair or a hangman's noose. <laughs> now, it's still nevertheless wonderful that the cross, which is such a horrible symbol of a gruesome execution method, is now the place of, of glory and honor because that's where everything changes. Now, in the next portion of, of the Gospels show Jesus ministering in Judea. And in the emphasis on this period is on discipleship and obedience. 
Every, all along this period of the Gospels, Jesus is saying to, his, to the followers, both his 12 disciples and the other crowds that are coming with him, he's challenging them to greater sacrificial commitment. He's telling them the cost of following him. The big crowds are built up in Galilee, and they want to follow him to, to Jerusalem and to, to, to Judea down south. But guess what? He's challenging them. This is where he meets the rich young ruler, so-called. A pious young man with stacks of money, lots of power, and he's a good, a good young man. But he doesn't want to give up everything he has to follow Jesus. This is where he meets Zacchaeus, a corrupt tax collector whose evidence of his salvation is he's willing to go, give away everything or anything that he needs to and make up for what he's done wrong. Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem and the cross, and his disciples have to go with him. It may cost them their lives as well. Whoops. Oh, what did I happen there? I got... Final week, somehow I got missed. <laughs> uh, slide just disappeared from me. All right. As they get into Jerusalem, we have what we call the final week. This is the period when Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is, uh, he is teaching. But particularly, he starts teaching on the end times. He's going to be predicting his return. He's going to be que ask, answering questions about what's going to happen in the future. And there are two key words that he uses in this period that tell us how the church are meant to respond to the promise of Jesus' return. Two things we're supposed to be doing while we're waiting. And they are, number one, watching. And number two, waiting. Watching means you've got to be alert. You've got to be ready. You don't want to let that day surprise you too much. You've got to be like those maidens who have their oil in their lamps and they're, they're awake when the master comes back as Jesus told, told in parables, this whole series of parables to talk about being on the watch, being on your guard, being ready. But the other set of teachings he gives is about waiting, being patient. It could take time. And so the church has to learn both to watch and to wait. So to watch means I'm, we've got to be ready for Jesus and every day. If you're not ready for Jesus to come back today, Let's stop what we're doing right now and get ready. That's the most important thing. But we also have to learn to wait, which means to endure, to be patient, because it could take time. It's 2,000 years. So, and in that period then, in that final week, somehow I had a whole slide on the final week, it's when he is... And it might appear, maybe it's got out of order. It's, this is, of course, when he is, uh, he has the last supper with his disciples. And he tells them to do this in remembrance of him. But the last supper is two things. It's, it's looking backwards and it's looking forwards. It's looking back to what Jesus did with his disciples and it's back to his death. He says, you, you know, it's his body and his blood. It's his death that we're proclaiming and memorializing in a meal. But it's also looking forward to the heavenly banquet when we all get together. And so, because he says, you're proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes, Paul says. And so it's looking back and it's looking forward. And it's picturing who the people of God are as they remember Jesus, what Jesus did, and look forward to him coming and this picture is a wonderful picture of a meal together. And of course, while I'm on that subject, in my view, I would much rather the Lord's Supper was actually in the context of a proper meal, personally, because that's how they did it in the early church. It took several hundred years before they stopped doing that. Uh, and uh, they took the, the, the elements out of the meal into the, the liturgical service. And uh, so I'm in a bit of a thing to get it back in there, but that's another, uh, another talk. <laughs> Another talk for another day. 
That's because I like eating together. So uh, where are we going here? And yeah, so then we have the, the Last Supper, the Gethsemane, uh, the arrest and betrayal, and then we have trials of Jesus. And Jesus has two trials, or three actually. He has, he has, he has two kinds of trials. He has religious trials because the Jewish religious authorities, high priests and so on, they had authority over Jews under the, and so they could charge you with religious offenses, like blasphemy, that's what he was charged with. Uh, and then he had civil trials under Pilate, also Herod, where he was charged with uh, uh, rebellion and troublemaking and, and things like this. And in John's gospel, Jesus is found not guilty at both trials and still is sent to his death. Because basically, uh, John is showing us how, how unjust the death of Christ is. By the way, it's a wonderful, remarkable thing that Jesus' death is at one point the place where justice truly happens, where sin is the, 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 the horrible nature of evil and sin is finally accounted for, and Jesus, it, the cross is a mighty act of God's divine justice, where his punishment on sin is worked out. But it's also, the cross is also an incredibly unjust event. The innocent suffers for the guilty. And the, the gospel writers, and especially John, take great pains to show you that Jesus was given really bad treatment. He was totally unjustly treated and unjustly sent to his death. They want to make sure that you understand Jesus didn't deserve to be on that cross. And that this was man's injustice to God. Now, after the cross, of course, as, and, and, I'll, and we'll just talk, of, we have this, the cross scene, which you're all aware of. Uh, by the way, if I'm ever teaching the cross scenes in the Gospels, words from the cross and that sort of things, if I'm teaching those, remember to focus on Jesus himself more than you focus on the feelings of those watching him. Mm -hmm. All right, now, we'll talk about this again in a minute. But the gospel writers want you to focus on Jesus. It's what, and it's him that it's all about. But we'll come back to that. We have the resurrection, of course, and there's a whole series of resurrection experiences uh, or appearances. I was once saw a debate between a very liberal uh, uh, scholar who didn't really believe in resurrection and a biblical conservative scholar and the liberal scholar was trying to, every time we, they, were, they were debating whether the res resurrection happened. And every time uh, this liberal scholar talked about the resurrection events in the Gospels, he told them apparitions. And he was, he was an Irishman. So he was talking like he said, there's another apparition, he said. And he did in this Irish accent. Uh, and... Uh, and so, but of course, they're not apparitions. They're not visionary experiences. They are bodily encounters with the risen, truly risen Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a whole series of them in Jerusalem, on the road to Emmaus, uh, in the upper room, fishing in Galilee, on the mountain, on, on, in Galilee, on the Mount of Olives, a whole series of them. And by the way, this, uh, these uh, pictures are from the garden tomb in Jerusalem, quite likely not, we don't know for sure, but it's quite likely the place where Jesus literally rose from the dead. Of course, after this, we have the Great Commission and the Ascension. There are five versions of the Great Commission in the Gospels, if you take the long ending of Mark, uh, and, in, and, in, and, a, and between Acts as well. Only Matthews and Marks are actually commands. The others are promises. The Great Commission is as much a promise as it is a command. This is what I'm going to do in three of these passages. Two of them is, this is what you're going to do. Because the Great Commission, of course, is not simply about telling us 
what to do, but it's about a promise that the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth. And you better get in on it. Now let's think about seeing Jesus in the gospels. I want to say this because the gospels are Christ said it. That might be the most obvious thing in the world to say, right? The gospels are about Jesus. They're all about Christ. You can't go wrong when you're interpreting the Gospels by asking, what does this tell us about Jesus? Every passage you go to in the Gospels, you can always ask the question, and I do this, what's it telling me about Jesus? Right? Now look, we are, we are ordinary human beings. We want to know how it relates to us. Yes, we do. So we all... We, we, when we read the gospel, we want to see ourselves in there. We want to see how it relates to us. And that's not wrong. But you can't do that before you find out what it says about Jesus. Always, always, always ask this question, what's this telling us about Jesus? I'll show you an example in a minute. Finding Jesus in the gospels is more important than finding ourselves. By the way, that's, that goes for whole of life. Finding Jesus is more important than self-discovery. Because when you find Jesus, guess what? You do find out who you are, truly made to be. But if, you, if your life is a journey of self-discovery, apart from Jesus, guess what's going to happen? You're just going to get lost. You won't find yourself, you get lost in a never-ending internal spiral of depression. Now, how do I know this? Experience, right? The more you look inward, the deep, the, it, it, without the Lord, the further down you go. Let's, in Mark 1, Mark 2, beg your pardon, 1 to 12, there's an interesting story here about a paralyzed man. Jesus is teaching in, in Capernaum in the house, his house, or where he's living. And there's a whole crowd of people listening to him teach, and including uh, some Pharisees and Sadducees, and they are, everybody's listening to Jesus, and people there's someone who, who's brought along, who's paralyzed. He's brought along on a stretcher and he can't get in. So they literally break open some of the roof there and let him down through the roof to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Well, the, the religious leaders there are kind of horrified at this. Who can, only God can forgive sins, they say. Who can forgive sins? Jesus said, well, look, to show you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, stand up, pick up your stretcher and walk. And he's healed. And everybody starts glorifying God and getting excited. It's an interesting story. I've heard this story taught from several different angles. One of the ways that I've heard it taught is the story of the four men who let the guy down through the roof. And the story is, Bring your friends to Jesus. Bring your friends to church, actually. This is how I use it, heard it preached. Because what happened? I mean, these four men are important in the story, and they are noted. They are noticed by the gospel writer. And Jesus sees their faith, and he forgives this man and heals him. So their faith's important. But guess what? Who's more important in the story? The whole point of the story, in fact, the point of the miracle in this story is to demonstrate that Jesus has divine authority to forgive sins. So if you preach this or teach this passage and you don't come to the, and, and, and your focus is not on Jesus having authority to forgive sins, having God's own authority to forgive, you've kind of missed the point. So the other elements can be sub, sub, subordinate points in your teaching. But the main thing has to be the main thing, right? So every time you get to another passage in the Gospels, you have to ask, what's the main idea here? Let's teach that. 
and let's use the other subordinate ideas to strengthen that and to support it. And notice what's going on. But you could also tell the story from the, from the position of the paralyzed man and tell his story. And you can tell his story that he was forgiven of sins and that's the good news. And then he was healed. That's great. And you can tell the story from the position of the crowd who see all this and what do they end up doing? Praising the Lord. Now, son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins is the key phrase or key clause in that story. Seeing Jesus in the gospels. Look at the titles and the names that are used for Jesus. Mark emphasizes Jesus as son of God. Luke emphasizes Jesus as Lord. John calls him the word of God. And Jesus calls him the lamb. And John, sorry, calls him, also calls him the lamb of God. John's the only one of the gospel writers that calls Jesus the lamb of God. Which, of course, is an, an allusion to Jesus being the atoning sacrifice for sins. Doesn't mean he's soft and cuddly, right? It means he's going to be the sacrifice for sins. So that's one way to do it. For, for example, in Luke's gospel, if you trace out how the word Lord is used, you'll discover that it starts off being used for God, as it often is in the Bible. God is Lord. And then starts to be used about Jesus. First of all, not by the participants in the story, not so, so much as by Luke, the author. He starts saying, the Lord did this, or the Lord did that. And then people in the story start to get, get with the project and understand it. And they start calling Jesus Lord. A title which is God's title now is appropriated for Jesus himself. First of all, by the author pointing out to you when he just called Jesus the Lord did this, the Lord did that. It just, you see that for the, for the author of, of the Gospel of Luke, that's Luke. He sees Jesus as the Lord. And then finally, the people in the story get it. They start seeing Jesus as Lord. So these titles are actually very important. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus is Son of God. First verse, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Baptism, this is my beloved son. You know as a reader in Mark's gospel who Jesus is. You know from the beginning that he's the Messiah and the son of God. The problem is that the characters in the story don't know. And they're kind of, who is this guy? Even when Jesus calms the storm, the disciples are going, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him which is kind of alluding back to the Psalms that talk about God calming the storms. And so you'd think they would get it. And by the, as you go through Mark, you end up shouting at Peter and the boys saying, come on, it's a son of God, come on. <laughs> as people are all kind of asking, who is this person? And, he, and when you start doing that, it's exactly what Mark wants you to do, which is to get with his project and, and see earlier than the, characters in the story who Jesus is and start to walk with him in that way. And so finally, when Peter says in chapter, you know, in chapter eight, he's a Messiah. Oh yes. And then he starts saying, Jesus, he, you know, and he said, come on, Peter, get with a project. But eventually Jesus confesses before the high priest that he's the son of the most high, son of the blessed one. And when, at the moment of Jesus' death, the, the man in charge of his crucifixion says, surely this was the son of God. At the moment of his death, he is known as the son of God right there in the crucial moment of his death on the cross. Following Jesus in the gospels means looking through the eyes of eyewitnesses because the, the Gospels are based on eyewitness accounts. According to Luke, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us 
just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word have headed them down to us. Gospels are written from a lot of accounts, and some of those eyewitnesses are named in the Gospels. I think one of the reasons we have so many names of minor characters in the Gospels is because they were around to tell their story to somebody and eventually found it into the Gospel. So, for example, and so one of the ways to tell those stories is to look through the eyes of those minor characters who maybe were the ones to pass on that story. I'll give you an example. Bartimaeus in Mark 10, 46 to 52, is a blind man, a blind beggar sitting by the side of the road near Jericho. The crowds can see Jesus, but they don't see him. They don't recognize who he is. Bartimaeus can't see Jesus, but he recognizes who he is. And he starts shouting out when he hears it's Jesus going by, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's one of the very few people in the Gospels who calls Jesus son of David. Son of David being, meaning the king, the Messiah, the anointed one who's come to rescue Israel and rule the world on God's behalf. He, and he calls Jesus also Rabunai, which means Lord and Master. And so he doesn't see but he, he sees, and his eyes are opened, of course. He experiences Jesus' mercy through healing, and, he, and Jesus said, okay, you can go now. And he, he doesn't go. He follows Jesus on the road. So look, you can tell the story through his eyes because he's a cent, one of the central characters in it. But if I'm telling the story, I'm still not telling simply the story of Bartimaeus. I'm telling about Jesus the son of David, who has mercy on a blind man that everybody else wants to shut up. That's Jesus. Who's the healing, wonderful Lord Jesus, who's worthy of following. I'm, we haven't got time to go through this whole sequence, but you can follow in the Gospels the journey of the disciples. You can follow the journey of the disciples in the Gospels. And Walk with them. For example, in Mark 6, we have the feeding of the, of the 5,000. Wonderful miracle story. A few loaves of bread, a couple of fish. And Jesus feeds a multitude. Right after that, starting in verse 45, Jesus sends off the disciples in the boat and he, get, he prays for a while and then he comes after them walking on the water. When he got into the boat, they thought he was a ghost at first, but he gets in the boat, the storm calms, Jesus is in the boat, he's just walked on the water through the waves. Wow. They're astonished. Guess what? There are two kinds of astonishment in Mark's gospel and in some of the others. Astonishment or amazement is a real theme in Mark's gospel. But there are two kinds of amazement. There is the amazement of faith and the amazement of unbelief. The amazement of faith and the amazement of unbelief. The amazement of faith says, that's amazing. Praise God. Amazement of unbelief says, that's amazing. I don't believe it. And the disciples were astonished. But it wasn't the amazement of faith, it's the amazement of unbelief. Because it says, because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts sort of were hardened. They've just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread. They've just seen him walk on the water and calm the sea. And they're amazed, and yet they don't really believe it. Because their hearts are hardened. Why? Because they didn't understand about the loaves. What's up with that? Well, Mark doesn't tell us until a bit later. In Mark 8, there's the feeding of the 4,000. By the way, do you remember how many, how many baskets full they pick up after these? Leftovers after the feeding of the 5,000? 12 baskets after the 4,000? Seven, right? Seven baskets. So, lots. Lots of leftover. Lots, lots of leftovers. You have to eat that fish pretty quick. Now, 
Right after the feeding of the, of the 4,000, very next thing that happens is the disciples, come, the Pharisees come to Jesus and demand him to show them a sign. Okay, he's just fed 4,000 people with some loaves, a few loaves and fish, and they say, hey, show us a sign. Okay, they're obviously not on board yet, are they? But Jesus says, I'm not going to show you a sign. He doesn't respond to that kind of uh, publicity-seeking idea. He's not going to try to prove himself to them. So right after that, they're in the boat again with the disciples, and the disciples, and he says to them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. The yeast is what you use to make bread. And they, so the disciples are not getting, not getting what Jesus is saying. Look, yeast of the Pharisees, yeast, 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 bread, lunch! Oh no, we forgot the lunch, man. <laughs> 12 hungry guys and you know 13 hungry guys in a boat and we forgot we just we forgot the lunch so they say oh we forgot the bread jesus says it's not about the bread he says are your heart still hardened he says to them don't you understand that he says how many baskets are leftovers he asked them were there after i fed the five thousand twelve how many baskets are left over after I fed the 4,000? Seven. Don't you understand? He says to them. Understand what? Bread's not a problem for Jesus. <laughs> right? Don't you understand who you're dealing with here? The very next scene, Jesus heals a man who is blind, but the first time Jesus prays for him, he only sees Jesus in distinctly, you know. And, it's, and then he has to pray for him again. And it's, it's a wonderful healing, but it's more than that. Perhaps it's a little parable going on here of the disciples, whose eyes are partly open to Jesus. And yet they see him indistinctly. And they need their eyes further open. And the very next scene is when Peter really starts to see Jesus. Who do you say to them? You're the Messiah. As his eyes begin to be opened. Okay, why are there four Gospels? Four, what's that? Four different audiences, possibly. Yes, good point. And four important perspectives on Jesus. They all tell the same story. Son of God, Messiah of Israel, who came, gathered 12 disciples, traveled around Israel, taught, healed, did miracles, was opposed, was arrested in Jerusalem, a tried, unjustly accused, executed by crucifixion, rose from the dead, and commissioned his disciples to proclaim the good news to the world. That's the same story. And yet, in some ways, they're, they're all very different. And we need it. The so, surprise is that there are only four. Luke says in his go beginning of his gospel that many were writing an account. We only end up with four of them. Maybe God just kept the others out of publication. They give four unique perspectives on the story of Jesus, and we need to hear each gospel's own distinct voice. You can't just harmonize them all the time and try to mash them all together. Except that they are fundamentally united, they tell the same story, but then try to listen to each one's own distinct voice. If you had four recordings of the same song by different artists, would you try to play them all at the same time? No. no. So, play the Gospels one after the other. Right. Look for the important themes in each Gospel. For example, Matthew emphasizes healing. He, just a lot about healing in there. Mark emphasizes Jesus' authority. Luke emphasizes prayer. Jesus is praying when he's being baptized. Jesus is praying at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus, lots of prayers in Luke when there, many of them are not in the other Gospels. And why does he do that? Because he's doing two things. One is he's telling his readers, you need to pray. But more than that, he's telling them in the, in the Gospel of Luke, even Jesus prays and that's when things happen. And guess what? 
that tells us that those things are really from God because they happen in response to prayer by divine action. It, in, it's Peter's revelation that Jesus is the Messiah in Luke happens after Jesus is praying. So, and then, of course, John emphasizes believing in Jesus over and over and over again. And listen to Jesus speaking. Last thing I'm going to say here. Ask always in the Gospels, who is Jesus speaking to? By the way, anybody got a red letter Bible with the words of Jesus in red? You know, I used to think they were awful because I, I used to think the whole of the Bible is inspired, not just the teaching of Jesus. But listen, I can understand. Jesus' teaching is really, really important. He's the boss. Okay? If, you, if you're a Christian and you don't yet know the teachings of Jesus, number one, stop. Start reading the the Gospels, read the teachings of Jesus. But the other interesting thing is, just by scanning the page in a red-letter Bible, you can see at the, where Jesus' teaching starts and finishes, and you can see, look at the introductions and the conclusions, and you can see exactly who he's talking to. And it's interesting, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, for example, Luke is very particular to show you who Jesus is speaking to, and that will help you interpret the passage, because he's, re he's speaking to those people. But the other interesting thing is, a lot of times when Jesus is speaking to people in Luke and other Gospels as well, at the end of the passage, other people comment, which means they're listening in. So Jesus did a lot of his teaching in public. I call it public discipleship. He did a few things in private. Most of what he did, he did in public. Public discipleship is when we do everything. We were teaching our people in the presence of others. And... That, mean, that creates an, an invitation for others to join in and to come in and to, and to be part. <coughs> Who's listening in? Like at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the crowd say, oh, he's teaching with authority because they've all come around, started listening in. And ask always, what's the main point? What's the big idea? And lastly, how do people respond? The, the, the gospel writers give you clues as to how you should respond by giving you the approved response in the way of positive pictures of crowd response to Jesus. If the crowd start praising God, you know that's exactly what you should do. And if you're teaching that passage in the, in the gospels to somebody and you get to the end of the passage and it says, the crowd started glorifying God, what should you be doing to, to apply that passage in your group? Praise the Lord together for who Jesus is as revealed in this passage. <coughs> because the gospel writer has told you how to respond to it. This is the one from Matthew 7 at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus finished this sermon, the crowds were astonished. This is the astonishment of faith, the amazement of faith, because he was teaching them as like one who had authority. If you get to through the Sermon on the Mount and you're not astonished yet, go back and read it again. <laughs> well, any questions now? I've finished my talk, but any questions you might have? Feel free. Yes. Question? I was trying to talk to my daughter who married into a family of Jehovah's Witness. I tried to tell her, all you have to read that gospel and you'll know Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. And she said, well, we believe he's the Son of God. <laughs> she believes, you know, God created Jesus and all that. And I said, not in that sense he's the son of God. Not in that sense he's the son of God. Right. Well, we believe he's that God created Jesus. And not in that sense he's the son of God. Not that way. That's right. And she, yep. And so I handed her a pocket New Testament from the Gideon. And I said, read the Gospel of John. Take a month and read one chapter per day. And after a month, I called her back. I said, did you read it? Yeah. I think you did. <laughs> Read the Gospels. Read them with heart of faith. She didn't, she didn't do it. She didn't. That's she right. Didn't. Thank you, everybody, for coming today and for being with us this session.
God bless. Thank you, George. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, look uh, there's my chat.